listen only mode. Rolling. Good evening, everyone. This is October 16th and the fourth monthly Jazz Journalist Association webinar, our fourth webinar, Blogging Tales from Veterans. I'm Howard Mandel. I'm president of the Jazz Journalist Association. Here I am. And I am here joined tonight by uh, Pamela S. Blonde, Willard Jenkins, Mark Myers, who are all esteemed uh, celebrity bloggers, and Joanne Kaywell, who is running the board. Um, Gee, we have uh, a little dispute about that, but... <laughs> that's Pamela laughing, but she uh, doesn't like to uh, show her face online, but she's got her opinions aplenty on her uh, blog, Be Bopified. So um, to begin with, though, I do want to turn this uh, microphone over to Joanne Kaywell to talk about the five other events in our blogging uh, uh, online uh, campaign, which starts tonight. So, Joanne, talk about those uh, other workshops and webinars. Okay, I'll talk really fast because um, we are going to just run for an hour tonight so that those of you who want to, and, and we definitely want to watch the uh, town hall uh, presidential debates tonight. But in any case, this webinar tonight is part of a series on blogging that the JJA is holding. And um, the the part of, you know, we'll, we will have another panel like this one. But what I want to talk to you about is the workshops, which I'm going to be teaching um, and Howard's going to help uh, on occasion. They'll be on the on the dates that you see on your screen, they're going to be not um, discussions like these are, but the emphasis is going to be on giving you really nitty gritty concrete skills so that if you don't have a blog, uh, you can get one started. And um, if you already have a blog, you can uh, take it to the next level. Each one of these workshops on the dates that you see is going to cover a few questions about how you can actually use the blogging software or do particular things online, connect with Facebook, or, or, or do very specific things. And another part of each workshop will also stress what you can write about on your blog and um, how you can increase your readership and maybe even make some money or at least use your blog at, uh, to further your professional goals. And so that's enough about that. Hopefully if you want to do that, you'll go to the uh, URL you see at the top in yellow. That is BIT with a dot in between LY backslash GXVOXD or you can go on our JJA Facebook page and there'll be more information about that and about how you can register for those workshops. Thank you, Joanne. So um, without further ado, we're going to get into the discussion with our veteran celebrity journalists who have taken up blogging uh, as being a valuable tool, platform, part of their arsenal for getting their information out. So Pamela, to begin with, uh, tell us about the Bopified, when you started, what your thoughts were when you began. Well, I started... I started the Bopified in 2007 as a way to report on the Monterey Jazz Festival, which I generally go to. I'd done some writing for another jazz website, and once my blog was up and running, I thought, well, maybe I'll review this concert or that CD, or maybe I'll interview a musician. And so, you know, it's a slippery slope from there on. It grew from there, and my blog is more occasional than any of the others on this panel, certainly more than Mark, who writes daily, and Willard, who writes very frequently. It's also more uh, pointedly local. I'm happy to interview national artists who come to the Twin Cities. I do that whenever I can, but my main emphasis is on our local jazz scene in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And by that I mean people who live here and work here, not that I'm labeling anyone a local musician. I know most of the people I write about. I've seen them play several times. I'm very interested in their evolution and their success. And I think that depending on where you live, and what kind of music scene you have, you're doing a real service when you write a blog with a local focus. And someone else I want to mention who does that really well is Bill Brownlee, whose blog, Plastic Sax, covers jazz in Kansas City. Uh-huh. Somebody that we should know about. Pamela, you also take photos besides putting text up on your blog, don't you? I take a few. My husband's uh, a photographer, so most of what you see on my blog is his work. Uh -huh. So, um, and it's very, it's very handy. 
to have a husband photographer if you're writing a job, if you're writing a blog, because it's like, can I have pictures? <laughs> and there they come. So um, that's, that's useful. My, his pictures, I used to do both, but his pictures are so much better than mine that um, he, does, he does that now. I guess that's a big income stream for him then. Oh, gigantic. Yeah. <laughs> it is, that's blogging is for me. Although, although you know, we, we talk about, you asked us to talk about the benefits, and although I personally don't make any money on my blog, my blog did open a door for me in 2007 for an interview with um, a website called minpost.com in the Twin Cities, and I've been an arts journalist for them ever since having an online presence and experience blogging, knowing my way around online. They were starting a website, and they wanted that, and they needed that. And um, so that was, you know, you can, you can sometimes, sometimes um, move from a blog into something else. And well. you're doing both now. I am. I am. Crazy uh, as it seems. <laughs> Which is why my blog is sometimes neglected, and I describe it as more occasional. Uh-huh. Well, I think that's a smart way to do it. Uh, Willard Jenkins, uh, you have a checkered career in jazz journalism. <laughs> All bright checks, I must say. So uh, also, Willard is one of the really founding impetus behind the Jazz Journalists Association. You've done so many different things uh, as a broadcaster, uh, also for WPFW in uh, D.C. But tell us about the Independent Year. Well, I, you know, I started blogging in 2008. So I'm a little bit behind Pamela and I'm sure Mark as well. And uh, the, one of the main reasons I started blogging was mainly as a way to convey ideas and thoughts and uh, issues that weren't necessarily being covered by the mainstream jazz uh, press. And it, it, it gave me an, an opportunity to talk about, for example, uh, issues like audience development, jazz audience development, which is very important to me because I'm, I also wear a hat as a presenter. And jazz audience development is, to me, the key issue as far as advancing this music. So it, it gave me an opportunity to write about things like that and other aspects that would not necessarily be covered or even be of interest necessarily to the mainstream jazz prints but which I have found a, a readership that is interested in knowing about. Uh, writing about younger artists and writing about, for example, writing about certain disparities that I see in the community as far as how artists communicate. And also uh, doing series of uh, interviews with uh, African American journalists and now currently with uh, women journalists. So, you know, the, the blog has it's expanded because originally uh, one of the main things I was posting was my weekly playlist for my radio program. And that was before we went to the uh, copyright confessor system where we post playlists instantly online as we are programming. Uh, so that was no longer necessary. But it's, it's just expanded and, and I, I kind of take an issue uh, kind of format about these things. And, and also dealing with some of the uh, experiences that I have with the music, that I, the opportunities that I'm afforded through some of the work that I do. I gather that you enjoy doing it. Yeah, I do enjoy doing it. I, I post, uh, primarily I post once a week. I usually post on either Wednesdays or Thursdays. I, 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 try, to, I try to discipline myself in that manner to post on Wednesdays or Thursdays. Why? Well, just because I want to have a certain degree of regularity for those who are who are uh, subscribers, so that they get a sense of when new posts are available, and uh, also because you know it's not as though I have anything profound to put up there on a daily basis. I mean, some folks do, uh, but I I don't necessarily have things that I want to put up once a week. So I, I you know to be honest, I kind of deal with my blog, I, I kind of refer to it as a webzine uh, as opposed to a blog. I think you and I had that conversation early on, and uh, that's that's just the way I've kind of postured it. You mean because you've got that kind of, I'm sorry? What did you say, Willard? You pose it as a what? 
a web zine. Okay, a web zine. Okay. Yeah. How do you make that distinction, Willard? I forget. Well, I make that distinction because, you know, to me, at least when people first began blogging, it was almost as though people were posting thoughts that were coming off the top of their head whenever they wished to. Like perhaps you had a random thought at 12.30 before you went to bed and you ran to, to your computer and posted on your blog. Uh, I guess I refer to it a web, as a webzine also because what I post is often not necessarily my original thought because I, I do invite contributors I do a lot of interviews with people, and what I'm trying to convey in those cases are their original thoughts, not necessarily mine. I mm. see. Uh, Mark, you have a very different take on um, um, Jazz Wax, which has won the Jazz Journalists Association's Award for Blog of the Year um, twice, I think? Once. Oh, but you've been nominated three or four times anyway. Correct. So w tell us a little bit about your mission, when you started, how you figured out you wanted to do this. Um, I began in 2007. It was actually on a dare. Um, I was sort of dared to start a blog and uh, uh, decided to do it uh, in August of 2007. Uh, since then, I've been a, become a contributor to the Wall Street Journal. My book, Why Jazz Happened, uh, is coming in December. Um, and my mission for Jazz Wax uh, has really been to interview my heroes, and I think heroes of other people who are fond of jazz dating back um, decades, um, and also to um, showcase recordings that I find um, particularly powerful, uh, but uh, may not be uh, very well known. And I think that's pretty much it in a nutshell. And you, you post every day? I post six days a week. How do you uh, work that into your schedule? I know you're busy with your Wall Street Journal work and you do some other things too. Uh, I usually start blogging at about 6.30, 7 o'clock at night and wrap it up at about 9.30. Um, the, um, I've, I'm, I've spent my career in the newspaper business uh, dating back to the late 70s, early 80s. So for me, um, doing things on a daily basis and keeping inventory and knowing what I'm going to be posting about um, is not very difficult for me. Um, but I, I know that for people who enjoy um, hearing firsthand from jazz legends and also people who want to know uh, what recordings um, are particularly special to me, might be special to them, they're hungry for this on a daily basis. And I knew that if I was going to start um, to stand out, uh, I would have to post, I would have to use my strengths, which is to post on a daily basis so that I would rise above everything else that was going on at the time. I see. And once, um, and, and by the way, once you start, once you do it daily, you can't go back. So uh, it's a it's a bit of a catch twenty two. Or an iron. Or an iron. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I said that's how thanks. it is. Uh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thanks for the thanks for the warning. Yeah. <laughs> go back. Okay. That's right. Don't you can't go back. All right. Oh, 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 do I yearn for the days of once a week or or? Uh, or no. Well, our friend Brett Premax says that the key to a successful blog is compelling content, regular prep posting, and easy accessibility. What and, does Brett consider regular? Well, that's what he says, that it doesn't really matter if you do it every day, three times a day, once a week, but that it should be on some sort of schedule, he thinks, where people know to come back and look for it in case they're uh, not uh, subscribers, that they can expect to come back and see fresh content in a regular fashion. And certainly, uh, we've probably all seen other bloggers in the blogosphere where their uh, sites just uh, become frozen for mm -hmm. weeks, months sometimes, and then all of a sudden they pop back and say, oh, well, my blog's been asleep, but here I am returned. And I think that the problem is then that you have to reclaim all of the uh, people who you work some interest up from and who then you've kind of abandoned. Well, you know, I generally send out a blast when I'm posting. And and I find that very effective because uh, not only do I send it to individuals, but I also send it to uh, uh, lists. And, 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 and I've, I've found that to be a very effective way of letting people know 
when it's coming out. And I guess that kind of gives them a certain sense of the rhythm of, of, of when things are posted on a regular basis. Well, I did want to ask about your outreach, but um, uh, ma e emailing a blast to lists. I know I have a web administrator who happens to be uh, working on this uh, webinar tonight who uh, takes great exception to the idea that you should be sending out um, uh, to lists. Uh, uh, well, you know, by lists, what, I, what, I, what I'm talking about is, for example, we have a listserv at the radio station of programmers. Uh, there's also the Latin Jazz group at Yahoo. There's a couple of those groups at Yahoo that I send that I send my posts or notices notification that something new has been posted that I send it to. Do you have subscription available on? Yes, I do. Also? Yeah, WordPress enables you to have my mine is a WordPress blog and it enables you to have a, a subscription uh, area. Do you have any idea what your numbers are in the subscription area? Well, you know, uh, as of July, it was uh, of, it was forty five hundred plus. I haven't That's crazy. Very good. Do we have numbers, Pamela or Mike, Mark? I don't discuss numbers. Okay, Pamela. I don't have any numbers. I didn't. I didn't go get any. I don't. Um, I don't really pay attention to that that much. Mark, you say that so definitively. I think you are paying attention. You have a reason you don't want to go into it. Can you talk about yeah. There's certain things that are proprietary, and to me, my, my audience is significantly large. Um, you know, it's international, like everybody else's, and it's it's fairly large. It, but the numbers aren't the issue, and I'm sure that the people listening in could care less. Um, you know, for me, I'm passionate about the reader. I love the reader, and readers know that. Um, which is why I post daily and which is why I answer all of my emails right away um, and um, which is why I also include readers when they write something that I think is interesting. Sometimes they even, uh, I'll even give them the half the page on a weekend uh, to talk about um, something that they eyewitness. So, you know, to me the reader, the number is, is less important than the, the love, I suppose. I would agree with that. Do I don't think e any of the three of you have comment sections on your blogs, do you? Yeah, I have comment sections. I moderate my comments, which is which is the terrible, terrible affliction of spam. When you have anything that allows comments, you won't believe the stuff that pours in, even if you oh, think absolutely. you're writing just a little blog. So I moderate my comments. And, yeah, I do, moder I do and, moderate mine as well. Yep. I, cl uh, that, I closed my comments. I moderate my comments, uh, and, you know, basically as a result of of the spam that you're talking about. Right. Hmm. I think my blog doesn't get that many comments because it's not getting that much spam. Oh, I mean, family. I must not have that many Fair readers family. because I'm not getting that much spam. I do want to mention that attendees can start posing your questions. Um, just type your questions in, and I will convey the questions uh, to the panelists. Um, but Following on this discussion we've just had, uh, this is along the lines that Philip Booth was asking uh, earlier in the day on the JJA Facebook discussion page. It would be enlightening to know about the identities of those readers. Are they primarily other journalists? Are they professional musicians? Are they amateur musicians, academics, record labels, readers who look to blogs instead of to the jazz magazines and newspapers, or in addition to those outlets? What do we think these readers are? Have we done anything to? Well, it's a good it's a good question. Uh, I can only tell you that the the blasts that I send out go out to people fitting all of those descriptions, and I I, I don't have a sense. I mean, I have people tell me all the time that they read it, and that can be, that's people from all all kinds of different walks of life, primarily jazz enthusiasts. But, right. Uh, you know, I you know I I don't I don't have a real finger on the demographics. Have you tried to enlist particular people? Like, you know, say, uh, I mean, I know you're friendly with Larry Simpson, for instance, at Berkeley. You say at the beginning, hey, Larry, you got to subscribe to my blog so you can see what I'm saying. Oh, he does. Okay, but I was just using him as an example. I, mean, I, do, I, do, I do have academics who, who, if you're speaking of, of the academic community, yeah, I have academics who subscribe because I, I teach on a university level myself. 
I mean, do we really go out and try to in, uh, enlist new new viewers? Is that an active thing that is important for bloggers to do? Yeah, I think it is important uh, when you come into contact with, with, with groups or with in individuals that you think uh, would be interested in what you have to say, by all means. I mean, I'm constantly... Uh, I'm constantly refreshing the list of people to whom I send the notices of posts. Uh -huh. Mark, are you doing any outreach in that way? Uh, it's mostly word of mouth at this point. Uh, the, the base is so large and the, um, the, the, the audience is so, the audience is made up largely, a large percentage are big mouths. So, you're dealing, you know, for me it's a lot of celebrities, it's a lot of people I've interviewed for the Wall Street Journal, they tell their celebrity friends, so there's a lot of word of mouth. Once you reach a certain critical mass, um, the, it starts to snowball by itself. The circulation uh, starts to grow rather rapidly because, um, as Willard points out, you're, you're consistent in terms of when you're posting, but more to the point, um, it, it's a very democratic thing, a blog. Um, if it's good, people come back. If it stinks, they don't. Um, so, so long as you keep the quality up, and uh, for me, um, so long as I continue to talk to the people that I talk to and they talk to other people, um, then what you see is this snowball effect or chain reaction in terms of uh, who's, who's coming on a daily basis and what the circulation is. Pamela, have you found that because you are localized, you've got a localized mostly readership? I think so. I do know that I've got some international readers too. It's it's interesting when you do a little bit of that tracking. Um, you know, there are a lot of a lot of Japanese who are interested in in jazz. Um, if, for example, an an international artist comes through town, and I mention, for example, whoever Dorado Schmidt's accordion player was, who came back a year ago, um, came through a year ago. I had I had hits from from you know more hits from Europe as a, as a result of that. I, you know, the people do Google searches for names that they're interested in, and they find you in that way. I know that, um, I know that a lot of local musicians read my blog, a lot of local jazz enthusiasts read my blog, and, and other, other people as well who sort of stumbled on it. I certainly think that, Willard, your idea of writing, posting regularly and making that known, that seems like a really good idea. I should discipline myself in that way. You know, I, I, think, I, I, think, I think we've, in terms of international readership, I think all three of us have had a, at least a couple of posts highlighted in that Jazz Institute in Germany. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah Darmstadt. That goes I have out, recently. Yeah, that goes out across the globe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Sometimes other have, people do your marketing for you. Yeah. Like that. We have at least one international attendee tonight, I think, I think John Fenton from New Zealand is uh, among our well, that's right. attendees. And uh, so hi, John, a shout out. But um, anybody who's got questions should type it into the uh, question box uh, that's in the uh, control panel. You're, you go to webinar control panel, and uh, I will convey that question. Um, you know, one of the things that you had asked about, Howard, was, um, um, you know, what about our development since you started blogging, and one of the things that, that I've noticed that there are more blogs to begin with and that blogging is taken more seriously than it was, you know, five years ago or, you know, whenever. Most of us started around the same time, it sounds like, but it's taken more seriously. And part of that is because of the, the, the there are fewer and fewer journalism jobs and fewer and fewer, um, you know, sort of, quote, official, unquote, jazz publications. And a lot of the good writers are blogging. And you know, I think that I, I agree with that, and I think that's also a product of something I was saying earlier, in that these blogs do give you the freedom to talk about issues, artists, and things that you want to talk about. Because I'm, right. I'm, I'm sure you've had an experience of, of of pitching a certain artist or a certain idea to a publication and being turned down. Well, here here's your opportunity to put that out there if you wish to. Well, in, if you do that, do you feel like you're um, cheating yourself out of a potential pay, paycheck? That well, you could have you know, asked somebody else if they wanted to publish that article, if you got turned down the first time, maybe go to a third 
you know, publisher and keep making the rounds? Well, to be quite honest, Howard, I'm not as active as I once was in contributing to the mainstream jazz prints. And then, Sometimes you just want to write what you want to write, you know. I th I think um I I talked about this with Willard Lynn Horton is, you know, she's just writing her own blog now. She's not even trying to get published in jazz publications because she wants to do it her way. And that's something that you can do on your blog. If you want to write, if you want to write about some up and coming person that nobody has ever heard of because you are interested in that person, then you can do that. If you want to interview somebody that you just have a deep personal interest in, and you want the inter interview to be long, you don't want to think I've only got 500 words, you know, then you do that. You have a lot of freedom. You know, if you want to ask other people to participate in your blog, which I've done a few times, Willard does all the time, you get to decide who is that going to be and who is it not going to be. Well, you know, thanks for the plug, Pamela, because Lynn Horton's interview is being posted this Thursday. Excellent. Look forward to the re reading that. Joanne, will you show my uh, screen, please? Yes. I did a blog posting just yesterday on this topic. There's nothing like a blog. It's the freelancer's recourse. Uh -huh. And I say on it that, uh, you know, it's because there's fewer and fewer professional outlets all the time. Uh, we may as well take the uh, blog platform as an opportunity to be uh, able to say whatever we want and to post whenever we want to and all the rest of that. But, but Mark, how do you uh, decide what you're going to do for your blog and what you are going to save uh, and pitch to the Wall Street Journal, for instance, the Times? Uh, the what I pitch to the Wall Street Journal uh, are things that are going to make money. Um, so um, you know the things that I'm using on my blog uh, really aren't sellable. They're perfect for jazz wax, but they're not necessarily um, commercial, um, or they're not necessarily hooked or pegged to something. They just happen to be uh, albums I I want to share, or um, an interview uh, that I did with a jazz legend uh, that I wanted to share. Um, but there isn't necessarily a hook or a peg. Uh, anything that I'm pitching to the five sections of the Wall Street Journal that I write for um, is always going to have a peg or a hook. So that's a differentiation right off the bat. Um, then as far as what I'm doing, um, I'm pretty much planned out for the next two to three weeks. I know exactly what I'll be posting on going forward um, so that when I do end my business day and I turn to blogging, uh, there isn't any wheel spinning. I know exactly what I want to post that evening and how I'm going to go about doing it. You add a couple of new uh, topics every day when you finish, or something like that. Uh, no, I you know when if I have ideas uh, or something comes up, I have a, a fairly um, complex calendar that I keep that um, tells me exactly you know how I roll things over. So um, if I have a two-part interview coming up, or I have a few a few interviews in inventory. I'll, I'll block them out on the calendar, and I'll also come across an album. I may come across a great Jack McDuff album, or today uh, I love Clifton Anderson's album uh, that just came out, so I, I posted about that today. Um, but it's pretty much keeping a very careful inventory. You know, the art of blogging on a daily basis is, is keeping inventory, knowing what you're going to do, and making sure that you um, uh, give the reader what the reader wants versus what you want to ramble about. Um, I usually try to get to the point, give the reader the heart of the action or the history behind or the drama behind what I'm posting about, and then get to the album, get to the music, or, or get to the life of the interview as quickly as possible because the reader has a very short attention span. The reader has about 40 things they could be doing rather than reading my blog. It's an honor if they're reading my blog considering what, what they have to do on a daily basis. So for me, my challenge is to give the reader what they want as quickly as possible. It really sounds like you embrace the role of an editor for yourself. Uh, did, did you work as an editor for newspapers earlier? Yes. I mean, straight out of college, I worked. I, was, I interned at the New York Times, then I was at the New York Times for five years out of college, and then I was an editor uh, at Adweek, uh, an editor at a, at a national monthly, and then I was the editor of a um, uh, biweekly newsletter, uh, and then started a dot-com in, in late uh, 1999, and then started my own company. So I've had... Um, you know, in terms of journalism, I've had the daily, uh, the monthly, and the biweekly experience, and now, of course, uh, the daily experience. Uh, you know, with five different sections of the journal. So, it's um, th there's no there's no greater. There's, I think 
the panelists would agree that there's nothing more exciting and nothing more rewarding than being read and being appreciated uh, for what you've written. Absolutely agree with that. Well, I'll go with that. That's why um, we do it. But, um, Pamela, do you, when you're writing for uh, Min.com, I think you said, it's do you have an editor? Min, Min Post. MinPost.com is a news and information website that was started five years ago by the former publisher of the Minneapolis Star Tribune and a bunch of expat Star Tribuners and Pioneer Press people who had taken buyouts or left for whatever reason when there was that great sort of purge of journalists a few years back. So mm -hmm. this is, um, these, are all, these are all highly experienced journalists working here, and I've had the, the privilege of working closely with them for the past five years and have, I might even suggest, sort of become a journalist. I mean, certainly not with Mark's experience, but, but um, the discipline of writing a certain number of times a week. I mean, that's where, that, that's where I've, I've, I've exercised that is in my, in my MinPost work. And now I'm doing an arts, sort of a arts roundup column with reporting. And, and of course, my passion for jazz, you know, sneaks in there more times than it would otherwise, at least, if somebody is writing an arts column who's including jazz in the Twin Cities. Now, that's a not very frequent thing. So, um, so that's that's. Is that your question, Howard? Did I just wander off? Well, I, I wondered whether you uh, felt that there was a benefit to having a uh, an editor when you're working for another uh, uh, situation, and whether I, you bring I, the I, lessons. Yeah. Back to I do because there are some there are some early mistakes that I made and I needed to learn some basics really fast. But I've also been a professional editor my whole life and I edit myself pretty thoroughly. So um, there's you know I can do some of that myself, but it always helps to have somebody who knows more than you do reading your work. And I also have musicians who you know and and, and avid avid jazz fans who read me and will correct me. And I'm more than happy when that happens. Thank you very much. Please keep doing it. I'm not seeing the questions that are coming in. Uh, I think uh, Joanne Cable is seeing them, so uh, she's going to send them to me, and then I will convey them to you. You know, guys. Howard. You know, you know what's fascinating about blogging, and I and I want to sort of address address the list address the listeners on this. Ten years ago, it would have cost you fifty million dollars to reach a worldwide market when you add in fulfillment, writing staff, marketing, postage, trucks buildings, real estate taxes, property. I mean, it would have cost a fortune to do that. And today, anybody with a computer can, can develop a worldwide market for zero, for absolute zero. And it's an amazing, amazing world. And we're really at the beginning of the internet and this ability to communicate worldwide. I mean, we see it you know, in so many different ways, whether it's Twitter or it's the Arab Spring. Um, it's just a fascinating thing that's developing, an organic thing. But from the writer's standpoint and the jazz writer's standpoint, anybody with a computer who has something to say, and I say has something to say because that's the only way you attract people to come back on a daily basis, you can do what it took $50 million 10 years ago. You can now do that for free. And to me, that's mind-blowing. Well, since you bring up the uh, money issue about what it would have cost to do this sort of thing in the past, uh, can we talk for a moment about whether uh, there is any viable income from what we're doing now? We know we can do this uh, outreach and uh, try to attract an international market for free. It doesn't cost us anything to do that. Uh, how are we beginning to get uh, any return for that? Mark, I think you'd said that you'd tried to monetize your blog recently you know for for you know if if you're writing if you're writing stuff and people are reading it then you have you, you reach a point where you can syndicate it you reach a point where you can commercialize it by um, selling ad space against it because if you are attracting the jazz market's biggest decision makers on a regular basis then you have space that is desirable. It's real. It's location. It's desirable. Desirable real estate. Um, so through advertising, um, through uh, syndication, and also by leveraging what you're doing into the mainstream media. In other words, um, even though I have the journalist experience that I do, that I have, 
Jazz Wax came before my work with the Wall Street Journal. It, you know, there's nothing like a blog to, it's almost like calisthenics or running or swimming. It, it's a great way to stay in shape as a writer. So in terms of, you know, monetizing, there's a dozen ways to do it, but much of it is going to depend upon the value of the real estate next to your words. Uh-huh. Uh, Pamela or Willard, have you had any experience trying to monetize? No, I haven't yet, but it's something I'm certainly investigating. So I'm all ears in what Mark has to say. Okay, well, those are good ears to put on, and he's uh, saying something interesting. Uh, does it require being able to convince the advertiser that you have the significant numbers or the significant readers? I, well, assume I, do, so. I, I, I do have I do have one uh, commercial opportunity on tap uh, with a high-end audio company, but uh, you know I haven't really gone out and canvassed for advertisers. And it's not okay, I'm well. getting some questions from some of our attendees, so let me hit on some of those. Social media, asked Jim J.R. Carroll, is it valuable outreach or a time sink for bloggers? Do you guys use social media in conjunction with your blogs? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, use, I, I, use it to, I use it to post, uh, to, 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 to notify people what I'm, I'm posting. So, whatever, so, so on a weekly basis, when I post something, uh, I put it out on Facebook and Twitter. Same here. And, and Willard makes a perfect point. I mean, you know, there are people who, um, you know, no matter, no matter what you've written and no matter what you think of what you've written, uh, there are people who just, you know, either forget or have a thousand other things to do. But, you know, there are certain what I call watering holes. Uh, or gathering places, town squares, if you will, in this internet, and Twitter and Facebook and others, um, th that's where those people congregate. So you need to let them know there. You need to take it to them rather than ex you know, expecting that everybody must come to you. You, you need to take it to them. Yeah, you can't, you, can't, you can't be passive about your readership. I found that sometimes when I post on my blog and then I post on Facebook, that it sets up a conversation on Facebook, but the conversation never migrates back to my blog. Yeah, that happens. Is that acceptable, or should I say, let's talk about this on my blog, guys, so I can build up my blog numbers? Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, because that's the, that's the classic <laughs> case of leading a horse to water. Yeah. Okay. People, people will gather where they want to gather, and they'll talk where they, they'll communicate where they want to do that. And if you know, I don't. I guess I wouldn't. Uh, I mean, you can try it, but I think you would probably lose a lot of people along the way who just, you know, want to go someplace else and do something else. Well, all, well, I'm, yes, doing, all, all, all I'm doing basically with social media is putting up pull quotes as a tease. Bingo. Right. So if somebody really wants to go, wants to wants to read the the full. The full Monty, then they have to come to the website. And the link, and the link, I'm sure with Will, I'm sure with Will, the link is there so that when people yeah, exactly, read, I'm, I'm just putting up teasers. Yeah, and the, the that's an important word, uh, Howard, that that Will just used, teaser. Um, the Twitter's Twitter's for a blog must read like a cosmopolitan cover line. In other words, <laughs> it, it 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 has to be seductive. It can't just be go here and read my post about X. Mm -hmm. You have to, right. everything is about seduction. Everything um, posts are about seduction. Uh, Twitter um, leads are about seduction. Facebook's about seduction. You've got to bring the reader. You've got to get the reader to click, and that's that's you know that's where it's at. And you have to go beyond. I did this. Look at me. Me, 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 I, I, I. I mean, if that's all you're doing, then you are boring immediately. So, um, you know, give a, little, give a little taste of what you've done, and if somebody is interested in that, then they'll come. By the way, Howard, I want to tell listeners about a book. Um, the book is called African Rhythms, The Autobiography of Randy Weston. Absolutely. And that's Willard's book, uh, and I think everybody who's listening should go on to Amazon and buy this book. The book is fabulous, and Randy's, Randy Weston's voice is so well captured by Willard in African Rhythms. Again, it's African Rhythms by Willard Jenkins, one of the panelists, and it's a fabulous, it's a fabulous ghost autobiography of, of Randy Weston. Well, Very nicely said, Mark. 
Thank you so much, Mark. And and, and you know, I, I you know I, I failed to mention in, in in my opening statement that it was the interviews and various things from that book process that really jump started the blog. Because uh, originally I was posting some of uh, the conversations and some of the various experiences because working with Randy for as long as I did on the book, you know, I had some tremendous experiences in different parts of the world. And uh, the blog became a means for me to share that. And in, in, in essence, for me, that was also kind of a teaser, like here, the book is coming and, and here's what's happening and these are some of the experiences that we're going to be talking about. And, uh, you know, I'm down here in Guadeloupe with Randy Weston on a, in a residency, or I'm in Annecy, France with Randy. And, you know, that served, I think, as a, a bit of a tease for the book. I certainly started my blog uh, when my book was about to come out, Miles Warren and Cecil, Jazz Beyond Jazz. But, Mark, you, your book about to come out, Why Jazz Happened, are you going to be turning <laughs> Are you turning your blog over to some teasings or some excerpts or some marketing for that? Uh, to some extent, but you know that's going to be it, it, it's it's limited because you know um, you know I, I really want people to buy the book. I think the book is is um, it's an important education uh, in terms of the history as it's as it's laid out. Um, but at the same time, yeah, you know it, it's important. Uh, you know, as Will had mentioned, it's important to um, mention what you're doing in that regard and to let people know it's there and let people know that you're available to chat about it. So um, more and more authors today, I'm now speaking with an editor, I had lunch with an editor recently, and more and more book publishers are turning to those with an electronic presence because they have marketing built in. Um, you know, Pamela Willard, you know, uh, myself, you, uh, there's an audience. You already have an audience so that when you, if they love what you're writing and you tell them you've got a book coming, you automatically have X thousands of readers who are potential customers. Ergo, the marketing departments don't have to work as hard. So having an online presence for anybody who's thinking about a book isn't a nice to have. It's essential to that. It's essential. Yeah, Let me yeah, ask that, that was important to my publisher. That was an important element to my publisher. Let me ask some of these other questions that are coming in from our participants. Are there other under-the-radar bloggers that you panelists like? Asked Susan Brink. Under the radar, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, to a certain extent, because of the subject matter, we're all kind of under the radar. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, 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 none of us are exactly Matt Drudge, you know, but... <laughs> but, but uh, uh, you know, I, I, we're all kind of under the radar. I, I don't know. How would you answer that, Pamela? I would say that, that anybody who is reading about jazz who isn't reading Ethan Iverson's Do the Math is missing out on something pretty important. Yeah, Ethan Iverson's so, Do the Math and a, a Blog Supreme, those, those are pretty essential reads. NPR's he, Blog Supreme is, is a really fine blog. Neither of these would I consider under the radar. I think those are the over the radars, actually. <laughs> well, those are, uh, but, 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 but Howard, you have to... The jazz writing is under the radar, Howard. I well, say, you have to consider the art form that we're dealing with. I'd like to mention one, psychedelicbaby.blogspot.com. And the uh, blogger's name is uh, Clemen Resnikar. And if you're interested in uh, uh, either psychedelia or it's uh, from the old days where it's current, uh, our, our emergences, this is a good place to look at, psychedelicbaby, blogspot.com. Is it a jazz blog or is that a jazz blog? It's a psychedelic music blog. It depends on your... Uh, psychedelic music jazz. blog. Howard. I would take it as Spectrum Road, Vernon Reed is in there, uh, you know, uh, John Schofield, Medeski Martin, and uh, Wood shows up in it. Uh, people it's there. orange. Would you consider Would you consider uh, Doug Ramsey to be uh, under the radar? Well, again, since I share space with him on um, Arts Journal, I consider him uh, about as under the radar as I am. I hope that's not under the radar. So, um, uh, but certainly Doug's doing a great job, and he was invited to be on this panel, by the way. But I said we'd give a shout out to him. He's accepting an award or doing something fabulous. Um, 
in uh, Washington State tonight, so he apologized he couldn't be here. Um, you know, Ethan Iverson's blog is, 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 is about the best musician blog that I'm aware of. It's musicians amazing. Are, musicians are moving a lot into that. Why do you say it's uh, amazing, Pamela? Oh, because um, it's got so much personality into it, and Ethan is so knowledgeable. I mean, I, I was reading when they were doing their um, Rite of Spring, when the Bad Plus was doing the Rite of Spring. It's a jazz trio. Maybe some of you heard that. It's pretty amazing. I was reading his writing on Stravinsky, and I was understanding about every third word, but it's still, I learned something. I learned something from it. He's very opinionated. He goes deep in his interviews. Um, he's, he's just an interesting cat, so... Um, so he's, a, and, he's, and he's also very generous as well. He is indeed. He is. In a way, this is the non-journalist blog, and it's not a hobbyist blog in his case. He's definitely a pro professional in the music, but he's not a professional writer. Does that in any way dilute the message, or does it help promote jazz over the, over the course of things? George Colligan is also doing a musician's blog. Several musicians have. I think those are important. If you can write and you're a musician, it, you know, it, 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 and you have something to say, I think that's really valuable insight into the process of making the music. What about hobbyists who are not so much musicians but are enthusiasts? Does that have to dilute it? Why, why are we concerned about diluting? I'm asking a question that Tony Rockwell has asked us. Ah, uh, hmm. I don't, I don't think it. I don't think it dilutes it. We all have the choice of, uh, we all have the freedom to choose who we want to read or not. If we, you know, don't want to read this person, we don't. I'm not worried about dilution. Okay. Uh, an anonymous questioner wants to say that the examiner stinks and asks whether the panelists can comment on that. Do you guys read examiner.com? Our friend Neil Tesser writes a blog for examiner.com. No, I, I don't have to read it regularly. Well, it has local uh, outlets, lots of places, and some of them. Well, I do read. I, I do read uh, Bridget Arnwine's posts on the DC Examiner. Uh huh. Because uh, she she's the jazz uh, poster for the DC Examiner. But is that considered a blog? I don't see why not. Well, that to me strikes that strikes me more as more of an online. That's a news site. Online That's a news newspaper. site. Yeah. Well, for instance, our, our other friend, Michael, Michael Shapiro, uh, has a video blog on Huffington Post. She calls that a blog. It's a regularly posted, uh, um, mostly, well, in her case, video, but Bridget's is text, and you can see all of the past um, uh, posts in the order in which they were put up. I guess they're searchable, um, so I don't see why that wouldn't be a blog. Well, I see that the word blog is becoming as, as expansive as the word jazz. <laughs> I've been and asking. Post, people have called MinPost a blog. It's not a blog. It's a news and information website. It's like HuffPost, you know. That's not a blog. CNN's site is not a blog. Well, I within think. HuffPost, there are many blogs. Like in right. Salon, there are many blogs. Yeah, I think maybe, th maybe, the, maybe the edges are blurring a bit. Hmm. This yeah, they absolutely probably, are. Well, do you think that it makes a difference for you guys? I know all, all. Well, Willard, your um, blog is connected to Jazz Corner, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But but it, it it is. I do have a standalone site within Jazz Corner. Yeah. Does that? Um, In other words, you don't have to go to Jazz Corner first to get to my site. But I am part of Jazz Corner. Does it do any good to drive more readers to your site to be involved there? That's a question I can't answer. I have to, I'd, have, I'd have to ask Lois about that. Mark, do you have any thoughts about whether you'd you know, like to have Jazz Wax be part of a larger institutional publication at some point? Uh, Jazz Wax is syndicated by Jazz.FM91 <clears throat> up in Canada, Canada's largest station. Uh -huh. uh, so I reach all of Canada um, through their homepage. Um, that's is, that Ross, is, that, is that Ross Porter? Right, yeah. Okay. okay. I was asked to restate Brett Premax three points. What he says makes for a good blog is compelling content, 
regular posting and easy accessibility. So you've got to be able to find that blog easily, uh, which probably requires some attention to uh, search engine optimization uh, principles. Do you guys do that at all? Do you pay attention to your SEO, uh, you know, pushing uh, keywords to the top of the post and stuff like that so search engines can find it easily? Yes. I've, I've never... I've never done that, but I just had the great good fortune to come up with this name that seems to be the first thing that pops up when you type it in. Not a, it's not a word, bebopified apparently is not a word in, uh, in, in Webster's. <laughs> Imagine uh <-huh>. that. <laughs> uh -huh. well, well, we'll change that. We're going to start using it uh, a lot. Right, John, <laughs> yeah, but, but always make it a hot link, would you please? <laughs> Well, John Fenton is asking whether we'd characterize All About Jazz as an inter interactive website, a blog, a webzine, or all the above. I don't really see why we want to characterize it, but uh, I mean, this goes to the point that Willard was making that this term is uh, broadening out, I guess. Now, I wouldn't consider All About Jazz to be a, a, a blog. Right. It's, it's edited. For one thing, there are people who are in charge of it and decide what goes in and what doesn't. Uh, yeah. To some extent. It's a to platform, extent. Howard. It's a jazz platform. Uh huh. Hmm. Platform. Um, the term. The anonymous poster who talked about the examiner said that what uh, they meant about uh, it sucking was the way they treat writers. I have not worked with them. I don't know how they treat writers. Um, I know Neil was saying that he gets paid such a small pittance per hit as to uh, it really not being even lunch money. For the examiner? Yeah. Okay, because uh, we know that All About Jazz doesn't pay a dime. Right. And, uh, and yet, <laughs> they don't want you to publish your stuff anyplace else. Right. So, um, you know, if, oh, you you if you've already something, put something on your blog, they don't want it. They want exclusivity for no money. I'm sure you could do a whole webinar on the all, the, the all about jazz issues. Oh, <laughs> and yet all about jazz is one uh, website of the year over and over again in the jazz awards too. So there are people who like it, and among our members. And there's a lot to like, no question. No, see, it's not about liking it. It's about it's about what you uh, what you deal with as a writer for all about jazz. That's the issue. Have you worked with them? No, they've uh, they've they've harvested a few of my posts. What do you think about um, our good friend Jim Migo uh, harvesting our posts and sending uh, those out as blasts? I saw he did that to Marks again, uh, Lenny Tristano. He does it to mine frequently. Who is that? Jim Igo of um, Jazz. Oh, Pop Jim. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He sends out people's posts. Yeah. Naughty Jim. Does he ask? No, no, no. You're looking at this the wrong way. Anytime your post is picked up and sent out, especially by Jim, it's a good day for you. Does you're, he you're, ask you, you? Does he ask you to do that? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You're in the wrong business if this is if this is how you're viewing this. This is about getting your name and be bopified out to as many people as possible. Um, no one's writing a blog with hopes of being bought by a Swedish billionaire. Um, you know, for $7 billion. This is about your message. The more people are picking up what you write and sharing it with others, the better it is for you. That's how I view it anyway. I tend to agree, and, 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 and my experience with Jim Igo is, well, first off, it's, it's, been, it's been all positive. But my experience with Jim Igo is that, that, that he'll turn around a blast that I send out and send it out to his list, and as Mark said, that's all good. It's not it's huge. Little, I haven't had an experience with Jim Igo sending out an entire post, uh, you know, just an excerpt or, or sending out or, or resending my blast. Uh, that's all I've had the experience with him. I, I'm not Jim, to... Jim picks up Jim picks up the stuff that he likes from my site, and he's welcome to all of it. Uh, right. and he can send it out to his entire blast. You, you're basically getting what you'd have to pay for for free. How can you argue with that? I agree. Uh, he does that to mine too. I'm not complaining about him. I'm just trying to get your uh, 
sense of what he's doing that way. And what other great. people who uh, send our stuff out. The more oh, Rob, John Rob Johnson asks, if the Huffington Post isn't a blog, why is NPR? And again, I want to make the distinction that Huffington Post is a platform, and uh, um, NPR is a platform. A blog supreme <laughs> is a post on the platform. Exactly. NPR has lots of different things on it, many of which are not blogs. And plus, NPR is in the broadcast business in the main, and uh, so the, the 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 a blog supreme is an adjunct to a broadcast entity. That's the way yeah, the best, the best way to look at this is a blog is a radio, and a platform is a car. A car has seats, it has a wheel, it has a, has a gears, it has windshield, um, and it has a radio. But a blog is very distinct. It's the radio in the car. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, do any of you guys want to show your uh, your blogs? Because we've just got a couple minutes here. So if you want to uh, show our participants your screen, I, I just clicked mine up. Can you see it? Uh, not until Joanne changes it. Okay. So and re readers, that. I'm not, but readers can simply go to jazzwax.com and you can read all about Clifton Anderson's new album. There's Open Sky Jazz. Yeah, and this is uh, this is the latest in a series of dialogues with women music writers, but women jazz writers primarily. Great post. Uh, great post. Thank you on the various issues that 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 they face as women writing about this music, and we know that women face various issues related to this music. Well, can you send me the link uh, to that? Because um, I'd like to use, I'd like to uh, direct my readership to your site on on, on over the weekend. Absolutely, Pamela. Do you think you have particular issues as a woman? Um, I uh, I dialogue. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I talked about that. On, well, actually, you can read that on Willard's blog. I think um, I I. Uh, I have just always acted like a writer, and I, you know, pitch like a writer. I write like a writer, and I'm trying. I, I can't say I'm, a, I'm. I'm unaware of 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 issues. I just um, behave myself in a professional way and expect to be treated professionally. I hope that so, happens. Pamela, can you send well, me your link too? Yes, I can. And my page is up, by the way, if if anybody wants to peek at it. Why don't you John, switch nice that over to Larry Honig? We have to end this up so that we can go listen to the. Uh, oh, I see that. Okay, call. got it. But uh, on November thirteenth, we we'll have uh, two more actually women uh, bloggers, uh, Angelica Beener and Veronica Grandison, as yeah. our panelists, along, uh, both of whom uh, come to us via um, Open Sky uh, Independent Ear. We'll they both contributed to this series that whole series. And also Alex Rodriguez, Alex Rodriguez will be a panelist on November thirteenth. That'll be the um it's not A Rod, is it? Sorry? It's not A Rod, is it? That's right. No, A Rod the trombonist. <laughs> Alex Rodriguez, our ethnomusicologist, uh now Howard, out Howard, I got I gotta go. I gotta go. We all gotta go. Many, thanks many, for being many. here, Mark. Thank you, Willard. Thank you, Pamela. And thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. Thank you, everybody. Hope thank to talk you. soon. Bye-bye. Howard Vandal for the Jazz Drills Association. Bye. Bye. Bye.